For people that don't know, Mike Adams is the health ranger, the man behind naturalnews.com. He has done an incredible job not just sharing his own story of overcoming his health challenges and being reborn from someone who was just another cog in the machine eating whatever he was told to the guy that has really held down this corner of the freedom movement of people waking up to the racket of government and, and big corporations, especially in the food and pharmaceutical industries. And he is the authority, really, when it comes to looking at these problems for a lot of people in the movement. I think most libertarians who know who Mike Adams is go, yeah, when I have a, a question, he's the guy I go to, naturalnews.com. They're the ones that I can trust to be looking at things from an honest perspective, from an objective perspective, void of the corruptions of government and the influences of major corporations. And I'm, uh, it's, it's been a, an incredible uh, honor of mine to have him on the show a couple of times before. And you know that's, in a sense, not really a big deal. You know, uh, Mike first came on Adam vs. the Man when it was a TV show in 2011 and told his, his personal story then. He's come on uh, recently to talk about his new lab and, and other things like that. He, we've, we've had him on before to talk about GMO labeling. And I'd like to think this is one of those like famous feuds in the movement. Maybe I'm overselling it that way. But that when, when Mike was coming out first on, on the issue of GMO labeling, uh, was also when I had the TV show and I was the guy saying, no, that's a government solution. That's a violent solution to require labeling. And it's not going to work. We have required labeling for corn syrup and people still eat the crap out of it because it's on the label and the government therefore says it's safe. And, and Mike gave me uh, just an incredible amount of credit for influencing him on that issue. And I'm, I'm so, uh, so deeply honored that while he has been doing all of this work, bringing people practical knowledge about health and medicine and fitness and things like that. I've been ranting about philosophy. And the fact that that has actually contributed to his understanding and helped him do all of the useful things he does is, is really an incredible honor. But Mike, as you know, what, what I've done with this latest book is taking it to the next level and presenting the coherent philosophy of freedom as grounded in the principles of nonviolence. And to know that you have not just uh, you know, looked at the book and passed it on or reposted or whatever, but that you actually took the time to listen to the whole thing and to really take it in and that you're calling it now so that we can discuss it and, and not, just, it, not so much the book as much as the complete coherent message of it and that you're considering this. And I, I took 10 years to go from I'm a libertarian because I'm, I'm not going to be a lame Republican or Democrat to where I am now understanding this philosophically. And I see that someone uh, uh, with such a beautiful, you know, open heart and open mind as you is going to be able to go through that process a lot faster. And I'm just honored to have whatever role in it that I, I, I do. Well, Adam, th thank you for that introduction. And, and I got to say, you're, you're a true American hero, a revolutionary thinker. And the reason why I always feel so comfortable talking with you even if we disagree on something, which we did on GMO labeling, is because I know that you are a deep thinker, mm. that you are always processing the questions as I am, and that neither one of us is 100% tied down to a conclusion we may have held. That mm -hmm. we, we can change our position if we have new information or new insights or new ideas. And I also know that you, as you know about me, will never be a corporate sellout or a government sellout that we we are deeply embedded in the ideas of liberty. You know, my background is libertarian as well. Uh, that, that we deeply care about compassion for, for not just humans, but life. And that we're not, we're not compromising. So I, you know what, from, from this day forward, I, I always know that I can, I can talk with you, I can explore ideas with you, I can brainstorm with you, even like I have a couple of challenging questions to ask you tonight, in fact. But I know that we can have that discussion and it, we both know it's not an attack, it's a brainstorm. It's like, how could this work? You know, let's get into the issues and see how, how can this work in a way that respects individual liberty. So that's why I am so comfortable having these discussions with you. Because you're, you're an open-minded, open-hearted person, but also a deep philosophical thinker. Your book is really insightful. Uh, for those out there listening who haven't yet read it, it gets 
even more powerful the deeper you get into it. And it's not that long. So, you know, just take a few hours and read the thing. It's very powerful. Well, th that's the problem, Mike. And, and man, what a beautiful way to frame the conversation here. That's a, a great way to set this up. But I gotta, you got to warn people about this book. You're going to listen to it, and it's only going to take you three hours, but yeah. then you're going to want 20 hours to read it, and you're going to want to go through line by line and, and parse things out and, and really understand it. Although I, I think there are going to be a lot of uh, sort of mainstream, maybe more casual people taking this in for whom it's like, okay, I listened to it. I got it. But Mike, you know, let's jump into it, man. Lay it on me. What, what, what's your reaction? What are your thoughts? And, and, and Please, uh, you know, I asked I asked people before we published the book, before we released it in this pre-release edition, to poke as many holes in it as uh, as they can. So I'm pretty confident it's bulletproof. But give me your give me your best shot, and uh, we'll see if it holds up, and and uh, maybe we can both refine our our understanding here. Well, this is really just an extension, getting into more detail about some of the ideas that you presented, uh, with some questions. Uh, in the book, you talk about localism, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful idea. You know, we, you could get into states' rights with that, you know, decentralization of government power, local control, local law enforcement, so on. Well, hold but on. Let me, let me uh, make a quick distinction for the audience. Uh, you said localism and localization. I, I describe these terms as two very distinctly different things. Localization is the process of taking governments apart from the top down. The localization of arbitrary authority until it is eventually dissolvable into a nonviolent society. Localism is bolstering local organizations, be they community groups or families or just neighborhood watch or even local businesses that do things that could happen at a less local level, bringing them back into the control of the community where they're uh, less likely to be corrupted. Great. Thank you for that clarification distinction. and. Um, also, just as a note to your to your listeners, right now much of the tide of localization is in the opposite direction towards federalization. Especially look at DHS, right? Mm -hmm. the standing federal police force taking over much of the activity of what local police used to do. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we really got to work hard on this uh, localization. Well, let me uh, let me, if I may, just uh, counterpoint with a slightly more optimistic note here. I agree that, as you point out, there is a trend in modern bureaucratic governments to concentrate power, and that trend is still alive and well. But at the same time, we have a global secessionist movement happening. Not only in the United States did we see the recent trends with petitions at whitehouse.gov, but we see movements all over the world of, of people demanding autonomy. And in a way, you have, uh, you have that concentration happening at the bureaucratic level, but at the level of public sentiment of demanding autonomy, I think that the trend is, is very strongly in the opposite direction. Good point. Absolutely, yeah, I, I completely agree with you on that. So um, the, the, the main topic that I wanted to brainstorm with you starts with this idea. Uh, you talk about self-ownership, very, very powerful, very important, you know, the, the, the root of the Bill of Rights, mm -hmm. self-ownership. We own our bodies, we own our decisions, our behaviors, now, it, it, you, you, you know that in addition to having libertarian roots, I'm also in a sense an environmentalist, but mm -hmm. not a lefty environmentalist. I'm someone who loves nature. Mm -hmm. And I love the medicine that comes out of nature and the, the real food that comes off of uh, a natural farming operation, so on and so forth. I think that sustainable life, we, we need nature, we need a clean planet. So what concerns me is that... Uh, our actions impact not just ourselves, but in some cases, others. Mm -hmm. So if I have a neighbor that's smoking marijuana in his living room, no problem. That's his business. That's his choice. That's his decision. Not my business to have some other police force come raid him, you know, to stop him from smoking a doobie. But let's say if my neighbor uh, builds a, a giant... Uh, metals processing facility and a giant smokestack and starts blowing lead and mercury into the air that falls on my farm or other farms in the community. Now we have a, now we have a pollution problem. Yeah. One person's liberty, his right to do whatever he wants, now impedes upon my right to life, liberty, and happiness. Well, hold, hold on a second. First, yeah. I, I, and, and I want you to continue describing this as, as you go. 
but what you just presented there as somebody's right to do this is violating my right to do that, uh, that's, if, if you're able to describe it that way, it's like you've got a, if you have a contradiction, check your premises. And in one of those cases, you're not using the term right properly. Does that make sense? Uh, okay, go, go on. Okay, uh, sure. So, so I have a right to utilize natural resources. Everybody does. We have a right to equitable access to natural resources, to, to live off the land, to uh, you know, take what is the, the, the bounty of the universe and, and use it to support ourselves, right? What we don't have a right to do, and, and this is in the book, and it, again, maybe it, it was uh, one of those passing points that, that really could have been uh, you know, a, its own subchapter, is the, you know, what it means when you pollute, when you limit other people's access to natural resources. And the, the, so when, you know, I don't have a right to make it impossible for you to breathe on your property. You know, I don't have a right to cause you cancer through my pollution. I, I have a right to say, well, I'm going to generate some trash and I'm going to have a landfill and I'm going to contain my waste responsibly and make sure that it doesn't affect anybody else. I do not have a right to simply use those natural resources in a way that limits other people's equitable access. But uh, to, jump, uh, to jump ahead a little bit, and I, I don't mean to, to, to totally cut you off because I know you're going somewhere more thoughtful with this. Uh, once pollution has happened, the, you know, having some violent reaction after the fact does not undo it. And when someone you know, we have to see people who are bad actors, not just as individuals, in order to fully appreciate what they're doing. So you, you said, you know, guy sets up a factory next door and it's, it's belching smoke into the air. Well, guess what? It's not just that guy running the factory that's doing it. It's all of his customers. It's all of his employees. It's all of his suppliers. It's everybody involved in that that has some responsibility to bear. And when it's identified as that and people say, well, gee, I, you know, I, I don't want to be a part of this. And this is uh, something that is, as you know, is necessary. And even in, in the issue about GMOs, raising awareness is almost more important than creating a uh, mechanism for justice. Because if people understand, hey, what you are doing is a crime by supporting a company that is doing this or by supporting these practices or by participating, we, uh, we see that the most effective means of combating this is, again, disassociation and saying we condemn this, we identify this, and we refuse to associate with people who are criminals. Well, I, I love this discussion, Adam. This, this is really great to be able to have share this with you. The, the, there are several issues with that. One is that corporations are really, really good at hiding the harm that they do and deceiving the public so that the public doesn't have good information about what they're buying in a free market. Absolutely. So for example, uh, a vaccine manufacturer known as Pfizer got caught um, killing Nigerian children by running vaccine experiments on those children in Nigeria. And most US customers who buy vaccines have no idea that the vaccine companies conduct medical experiments on children in other countries mm -hmm. or that the National Institutes of Health ran medical experiments with government funding in Guatemala that was then handed over to the drug companies to develop pharmaceuticals. So one point is, and this, is, this actually isn't my main uh, topic, but one idea that I think we need to consider is how do we handle when corporations really hide their harm or their, their pollution or their crimes against humanity, but then present a really, really positive image to the public that sure. fools the public into buying sure. the product. No, this is, this is a, a great question, and, and I love that you are coming at this from, a, from an honest perspective, because I see that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, having read the first chapter, you know, getting the philosophy, describing yourself as a libertarian, I know that you understand that nonviolence is the way. It's a matter of how do we figure out that non, you know, nonviolence achieves this, that, or the other, and when you have these objections, it, it is really important. When you don't see, when it's not obvious how nonviolence provides a solution, that we really do examine this and we square it against our assumptions and our premises here. So to answer this question or to, to address this issue more directly, we really have to understand why this problem exists in the first place. And if you understand force and violence to be the detrimental things that they really are, 
when you can identify those in a situation, it's much easier to find the nonviolent solution. So when you see this and you go, but it's the, the, it's the, the customers are ignorant of this. There's no you know, possibility for them to, to exercise this great market mechanism by which you speak of, Adam. And I would say, yes, you're absolutely correct. In our current environment, there is a problem. And the problem is corporatism. The problem oh. is the lack of competition. So you mentioned the vaccine manufacturer. And you said that most Americans have no idea that when they go to their Walgreens, right, and they buy a flu vaccine, that they're buying from a company that is doing horrible things, whatever, if it's polluting or experiments or whatever. Is, is that uh, a fair summary of, of what you were? Yeah, exactly. Or even take Apple uh, as an example. So Apple products, iPhones manufactured in, you know, near slave labor conditions or, or Nike, as you mentioned earlier in the show. I think there's so many examples of corporations that can really hoodwink customers they control the press, they have good PR, they have great advertising, but behind the scenes, they engage in activities that the public would never support mm -hmm, if the mm -hmm. public had awareness. Ah, exactly. Ah, and now, 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 ooh, you are already just, you, you are all around the free market solution. You are like, you are, you are just grasping on either side of it. If, what, you said if the public knew what they were doing, they would never support it, right? Exactly. Awareness is the key. All right. All right. All right. So, no, but very specifically, you, you, I've got two answers to this that you're going to love. And one of them is, yes, people simply have to be more aware. People have to pay more attention, be more conscientious consumers. And that's part of what we are advocating as a freedom movement. The main important thing is that we uh, be conscientious of the businesses that we support supporting violence and 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 as nice as it is to get into these issues in the abstract the most important business that we can disassociate from is the organized violence of government but yeah, right right well said to get to your and and, and I'm, I'm so excited again to be talking to you when you're you're on that same page with that core passion for freedom and nonviolence from that perspective but to get into this so you, let, let's say it's a flu manufacturer, a flu vaccine manufacturer that's operating under American corporatism. And they've got all the benefits of that. So they have no competition effectively, right? They have or, complete legal immunity they have, by yes. act of Congress. And they have legal immunity and they have corporatist protection and yep. they don't have competition because it's impossible to raise the money to compete with them. And if you could, you'd be just as corrupt in today's world. So, regulatory monopoly, right. So, so my, my answer is sort of two-pronged. One is the raising of awareness of consumers. But two is you can actually harness the market to foster awareness of consumers. Because think about this for a second, Mike. Really simple scenario. All of a sudden, the competition is made possible because government goes away. You've still got the same corrupt vaccine manufacturer, but now, now yeah. Mike Adams, naturalnews.com vaccine company can provide their alternative. And I don't know if you ever want to endure it. If I'm, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, 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 I'm. Like a clean vaccine, uh, no mercury, not tested on children in Nigeria. I get it, yeah, okay. you're exactly right. Okay, so hold on, Mike. Actually, I, if, if I may um, interrupt this, flow for just a second, because I want to ask you an aside as the health ranger, are you, because I know you do a lot of work um, talking about uh, avoiding vaccines, and, and I know that for myself, from all the vaccines that I've been fed from the Marines and all the other BS like that from government, um, that at this point, there's no reason for me to ever have another vaccine, like that the mainstream flu vaccines that, that, that they sell are more of a risk than they're worth for someone like me who's young and healthy. Are, are you one of these guys saying no vaccines ever or that there is a, uh, a limited, legitimate application of this technology? No, my, my view is that vaccine immunization theory has a, a legitimate scientific basis, but um, I have a vaccine vial, uh, I'm holding it right here as I'm talking to you, and the insert itself admits that the vaccine contains uh, 25 micrograms of mercury, mm -hmm. which is a significant amount to be injected into your body. And the insert admits in plain black and white, although you have to read it with a microscope, that uh, there is no scientific evidence showing that this vaccine reduces the incidence of the flu. 
<laughs> what? Uh, it's, yeah, it's right on the insert. I've I published it on, in an article on Natural News. This is and this is manufactured by GlaxoSmithKline, <laughs> the same company that was uh, fined billions of dollars by the U.S. Department of Justice for bribing doctors and committing felony crimes, which the company admitted to committing. So, my my my, the answer to that, Adam, is I'm not against the theory of vaccinations, but what we have right now is, like you said before, criminal corporatism. We have criminal corporations that are poisoning us. Uh, they, they don't have to put mercury in vaccines. It's not necessary. And they're, they're, they're selling vaccines that don't work and that are admitted not to work inside the box. So here's a great example of how... They can tell a consumer, you know, hey, we gave you the information. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, nobody can read that without a microscope. And when you go get a vaccine at Walgreens, guess what? They don't hand you the box and the insert. They inject you with a needle, and that's it. <laughs> they don't right. give you the information. It's, isn't that fascinating? All right. So, Mike, here's the free market solution you were just ever so close to grasping, that you, you were all around this. <laughs> the competition comes in because government goes away. And what does the competition say? Hey, consumer, we've got the vaccine that was not tested on children in Africa. Hey, consumer, we've got the vaccine that we didn't have to kill a bunch of people to create. Hey, consumer, right. we've got the vaccine that doesn't have any mercury in it that's not going to kill you. Hey, exactly. hey, consumer, check this out now. The government stopped subsidizing the food industry through the uh, subsidization of corn, right? And, and, and I'm, I know you've seen uh, yes. Food Inc. and you're familiar with all of the uh, influences of the corn industry and how corn is now, even in everything in McDonald's and all the meat is corn fed. Well, <laughs> <I know. laughs> you take away that subsidization, guess what? Now you have the potential for competition and the competition says, hey, consumer, we're making burgers that aren't going to kill you. Hey, consumer, we're making burgers that are actually from grass-fed beef. Hey, we're making sodas that are not full of corn syrup, that are actually either natural sugar or something else. Like, we have the ability to do this now. And so if you, if you see this now in terms of, you know, going back to your original issue, how do you deal with this? Well, when it's, hey, consumer, you got to buy gas. You can get it from Exxon, Mobil, Shell, or BP, and that's it. And you don't have a choice because anybody else coming up you know, can't compete. Well, you can't say, you know what? Hey, I want to spend 10 cents more per gallon to know that my, my, at least my oil is being refined in a way that's not destroying people's homes like it is, you know, in, in the Gulf in, in Texas where, you know, these, these massive refineries are just violating people's property rights with the immunity provided for them by government. I, right. I think people want to be good. It's just the institutionalization of everything that's bad in government that's holding us back right now. But I would, uh, and I think you can say that you've gotten this from the book as well now, that I'm putting this in evolutionary context. People are striving and evolving to be better people. And we are living at the most peaceful times in human history right now, where you as an individual are less likely to be subject to, to interpersonal violence than ever before. That's an amazing thing to be celebrated. And if you think about it, it's sort of like we used to live in a world of universal violence where every human being had to be afraid of each other. And that was like, that was the norm. And, and maybe I'm exaggerating, but compared to today, <laughs> whereas today we've evolved to the point where all we have left for regular, consistent, violent immorality is government. Like that's the last piece of the pie. Like we've taken all of humans' tendencies to violence and evil and concentrated them in government. And now we've just got this one last little piece to get rid of. Well, I, I, one of the things I appreciate about your book is the optimism. And actually, some of that kind of rubbed off on me, too. I, you Excellent. Know, you're, you're, you're right about humanity is pretty darn innovative and has been through a lot of hard times. But uh, I want to ask you this about, about violence and about societal violence against individuals on what I call this, this spectrum of, of harm. Hmm. Uh, and this, this came out of you know, listening to your book and, and thinking about it. And here's, so here's the thing. Um, take that example I mentioned earlier of a, somebody who's polluting. Um, that doesn't kill anybody immediately. So on the, on the spectrum of harm, it's not very high. But mm -hmm. suppose there's some other neighbor that uh, buys 10 rocket launchers and sits on the overpass of the highway and starts 
uh, you know, this is just a crazy theoretical example, but he starts launching rockets at, at cars that pass underneath. Uh, that's the high end of the, the spectrum of harm. And then right. on the very, very low end would be somebody who runs around popping children's balloons at birthday parties. Okay. <laughs> now, on the spectrum of harm, you've got uh, always one individual uh, committing different acts of uh, either virtually no harm or extreme harm against others. Now, my question to you is, and I have this question to myself, this, by the way, this is not an attack, this is an actual, how, what is the right answer? I don't mm -hmm, know. Mm -hmm. But at what point is it appropriate for a, a community or a society or a group of neighbors to commit an act of violence to stop this individual, to use coercion mm -hmm. for public defense, and mm -hmm. the second part of that question is then who do we ask to do that, or who do we grant the authority to to do that? Sure, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question, but the answer makes it mo is actually very simple and makes things very easy. Now let's first take the example of someone who is an immediate violent threat. There is, there is a line there. You are currently, right now, a violent threat. I can look at you running around with that knife or that gun and shooting innocent people and, or, or you know, uh, driving around recklessly and, and driving through crowds, and I can say, right now, you are making yourself a threat to others, and I am justified in using up to deadly force in order sure. to stop you. Now, as, 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 as very black and white. Yes. Very clear. Now, as an aside, I will say I'm very excited that technology is going to eventually render deadly force obsolete in those scenarios, that we're going to have you know, set phasers to stun, and you're going to be able to preserve the value of someone's life even in a situation like that. But that's... The gray area is when you start moving down the spectrum of harm. Right. No, no. I, I'm starting with the easy stuff here, Mike. I'm starting with the easy stuff. So that's, that's one thing. And then the next thing is sort of like if they are, maybe you can isolate someone. Maybe there's someone doing that and you can tackle them and they're not dead and you put handcuffs on them and you forcibly isolate them until they are not a threat. This is different from punishment. This is society right. doing a practical thing to preserve the value of life, right? But who are we giving the power to in society to engage in these actions? Ah. Is, it a, is it local law enforcement? Is it the sheriff model? Is it county? What? Well, first, what? sure, First. sure. Well, and this, again, this is one of those things that's like a sentence in the book that could have maybe been its own chapter, which is that when we decide as a society that we want to embrace nonviolence, we are going to at first have the private versions of these public institutions that we have under government now, and they're, all we're going to do is find different ways of funding them through nonviolence, right? That's the first thing. But at first, they're going to resemble what we have today. Like, it's, it's not that hard to think, okay, well, the first thing that we're going to get is the private version of government services. And it's not going to be that great, but it's already going to be hugely better because at least it's accountable to the, to the customers. And mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I, I want to say that uh, I could predict all the various mechanisms that a free society is going to demand. I, I also want to point out here that a lot of these questions, as, as legitimate as they are, Mike, uh, that, that people ask about, like, personal crime and drugs and things like that, 90 plus percent of that goes away without government anyway. And, and I know you understand what I mean by this when That's I say really that, point, yeah. that, you know, so poverty, desperation, right. you know, the drug war, all of these things created by government go away. And like right with that, 90 plus percent of interpersonal crime disappears to begin with. So that being said, the problem already becomes way less expensive. So uh, now to get to, to the, the tricky part of answering your question, if someone goes around popping balloons at a birthday party, right? Do right. I, do I ha hypothetically under this concept of justice, I can say, hey, you've done damage to my property, right? You've, you burst on my balloons and they were worth 50 cents each and that cost me $10 and now I am morally justified in forcibly taking $10 from you, right? Now, is the act of doing that even worth it? Obviously not. It's such a yeah. petty thing. It's better to just say, hey, we're not going to invite this guy to our parties anymore. We're going to disassociate from them. 
And that's yeah. actually the most powerful thing. And here's what's so cool about this that I think a lot of people fail to appreciate because they're looking at this from the traditional punishment, law and order. There is a set punishment for something versus not, you know, as opposed to, well, no, no, no. In a free society, the ultimate mechanism of accountability is ostracism and boycott. And this is in the chapter in economics, but it has such a, a wide ranging uh, application that it really is, is more relevant than just in economics. But if someone's the guy that goes around popping balloons at birthday parties, you just stop inviting him to parties. Now, what if it's smoking pot, right? Smoking pot's not a crime. You're not violating my rights. But if I say, you know what? I hate stoners. And I think people that smoke pot are really stupid and I don't want to have anything to do with them. It's totally my right to just say, if you smoke pot, I'm not ever gonna hang out with you. I'm not gonna do business with you. I'm not gonna hire you for my business. Mm -hmm. I have that right as an individual. So that, when, when you see that the mechanism, uh, the, the most effective mechanism of accountability is, is ostracism and boycott rather than violence, then you see that there's a whole spectrum of, of, of potential reactions based on every individual that meets, as you described it, the spectrum of, what did you say, spectrum of offense? Spectrum of harm. Spectrum of harm, yes, spectrum of yeah. harm. So if someone goes around popping balloons and has popped, all, popped my balloons and like, hey, the, let's say the guy got drunk. Let's say, let's say he's a good guy and he just got a little carried away at, at my little daughter's birthday party and got a little drunk and was depressed that his girlfriend just dumped him and started popping a bunch of balloons, right? But then he says, oh, dude, you know what? I'm, I'm so sorry. You know, I popped $10 worth of balloons. Here's 10 bucks. I'm out of here. I, I take it back. You know, I apologize. Please accept my apology. You know, then we go, all right, well, I've been made whole. I've been fully compensated for my loss. The guy has done his, his job. I'm okay. But let's say he doesn't. Say he stumbles home drunk and, and everybody in the community knows. Everybody who was at that party goes, hey, he's that guy. Well, guess what? People are going to go up to him. Hey, you know, like he, he goes and knocks on, the, on his neighbor's door, says, hey, can I have a cup of sugar? And the neighbor says, well, no, you're the asshole that popped all those balloons. And he might say, yeah, that was me. I guess I'm an asshole. Don't do business with me. I'm going to go home and hang my head. Or he can say, you know what? Hey, I, I already paid him the 10 bucks. I went back the next day and I apologize and I, I made good on the harm that I caused. I am now, my reputation is restored in the community. I have made good on my debts and sure. you should still, you know, loan me a cup of sugar because I'm a good guy and I've proven that. So in, in that range of possibilities, you have the whole spectrum of responses to the whole spectrum of harm. To someone is a murderer, then, you know, there might be, they, they might need to be forcibly isolated, but if they're not an immediate threat, it might just be that they're ostracized from their community. And that's even a more effective means of, of controlling behavior. And we talk about this in the hypothetical, but once a society has embraced this, if the guy who gets drunk and starts popping balloons goes, oh shit, if I just walk home now and I'm just that asshole tomorrow, my reputation is gonna suffer because people are gonna hold me accountable for that. I better give, give my host 10 bucks and say I'm sorry before I go. I better be responsible and accountable because people are gonna judge me based on that. Then these problems don't even come up in the first place. You know, exactly, and, and one of the most profound things that you've said tonight is how much government distorts the free market economy, the decision process, and accountability. And as a, a, an example of the balloon popping example, what if the guy popping balloons is a TSA agent <laughs> at the party, and he is there for your security. He's checking out all the children, <laughs> searching the children, and popping balloons. And basically, see, there's no accountability then uh, because government has distorted the entire social structure and the structure of local power. So, Mike, are you trying to say that TSA agents are pedophiles? Of course not. Why would I <laughs> ever imply such a thing about TSA agents that pat down? little boy <laughs> well mike your your actual your the way you describe that is really brilliant for me to 
go to the next level with this in terms of the immediate implications and the way that you describe the contrast. Yes, government protects people from accountability. It doesn't matter how much we hate the TSA. It doesn't matter how much people understand that it's a racket, that it's kabuki security theater. The government is going to keep stealing from us in form of taxes in order to pay that TSA agent's salary, and there's nothing we can do about it except, you know, as, as I'm sure you're as much a fan of as I am, of, uh, you know, doing everything we can to avoid paying taxes. But this also points to a wonderful solution that, that I've advocated before, specifically regarding police. And if you understand what the police are, and you understand why there's no such thing as a good cop, because they all work to protect the bad ones, then you understand that if there's a cop in your life, you should probably disassociate from them. And, and if, if, you, you know, like if, if a cop hits on you at a bar, ladies, tell them, no, I don't date pigs. You know, no, I don't date, or if you want to have a more intellectual response, no, I don't date those who are part of a violent protection racket that violates people's rights is, is its premise. Um, if, you're, if you're married to or dating a cop or a TSA agent or a soldier who is essentially a paid killer for government, if you can confront them on that and say, you know what, I'd really rather you not do this. I'd, I'd be much more comfortable being in a relationship with you if you decided to renounce uh, initiation of violence as an agent of force of the state. And if they say, well, screw you, I think that if government says it's okay for me to shoot or grope or maim someone or cage someone, well, then by golly, I'm going to do it because it's a good paycheck. Then you can go, wow, you're a disgusting person. And you understand that you're a disgusting person, and I no longer want to have anything to do with you. Have a nice life. I think if everybody understood that, we wouldn't even have to uh, address the government itself centrally. We would, uh, you know, all of the enforcers would quit their jobs. Well, you know, I have to I have to challenge a little bit of that, Adam. Um, in that I've I've personally known a lot of really dedicated local law enforcement members, uh, but I've also seen some that got out of control. Mm -hmm. So I've seen both kinds. But the real question is. Uh, even in, a, in a, a society that's not run by the federal government or even state government, let's say we have a local town, you know, we're going to have to hire some group of enforcers yeah. to handle the people. Yeah. So there's always going to be this, this um, character or, or, or stereotype almost. An of, agent of force. Of, right, an agent of force to serve the market's right. demands for violence as, as justified, whatever they are. So I think if, if you look around the world, you know, m a lot of cops in most countries are really, really corrupt. Uh, what I see in the U.S. is in rural areas, they're, well, they well, tend to be a lot more honest, and in, in, in the cities, they tend to be a lot more corrupt. Yes. That, that's my observation. Well, hold so on, far. hold on, Mike. Let me just, yeah, yeah, no, no, you're, it's, it's, very, it's, a, it's a great observation. I just want to point out, you said most agents are corrupt. No, every police agency in the world that is working for a government is by definition corrupt because their money comes from stolen funds. It is stolen okay. through taxation. Yeah. Uh, and, and that alone disconnects them from true accountability to the people they're supposed to serve. Although you point out so well that yes, in more local communities, there is that accountability. And so the cops are much more likely to do what the community wants rather than the politicians in some far off capital. Well, I can, I, can, I can tell you firsthand that some of the police, uh, you know, I lived in Ecuador for a while, and this is kind of a joke. They're not all government-funded because they would knock on my door and ask for money from me. So, and I gladly gave it to them. So I know they're at least part of the expats that are living down there. Well, no, at least there, you know, it's, it's certainly more legitimately a protection service. And a lot of Americans hear stories like that, and it makes them kind of nervous. Like, oh, you can just bribe the police? Well, Jeff Berwick makes the point uh, uh, very often, very well, that you know, for him living in Mexico, the uh, the more corrupt the government is, or the more free you can be. You know, which which country are you more free in? If you get pulled over for speeding, you get a ticket and you have to go to court and you have to argue before a judge. And then if you don't pay, you have to go to jail and da, 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 and all of that. And maybe it's a few hundred bucks, right? Whereas in Mexico, you get pulled over for speeding. It's like, hey man, here's twenty bucks. You leave me alone. Cool. Hey, you that's know, a. Yeah. It's a really valid point. In fact, I had, I had a, a very interesting personal story. You know, someone attempted blackmail against me in Ecuador, and it was because I had donated money to the local police hmm. that they agreed to help me wear a wire and get evidence against Ooh. this person that was attempting to blackmail me. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, yeah, 
Yeah. It was it was like because I had given these people enough money to buy a motorcycle in this case, <laughs> a, you know, a, a police motorcycle, because they couldn't afford the gas for their pickup truck. This is a true story. I, I'm, I'm not making this up. So we were donating money for them to buy a motorcycle, and then when it came time, I was able to get their help. Whereas if I needed a, you know, <laughs> law enforcement to help me get out of an attempted blackmail in the in United the US, States, if I oh, called the FBI, man. they would say, sorry, Piss we're off. busy. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. No, and that... And that's, again, just such a destructive effect of the racket of the monopoly in the United yeah. States that you can't seek those alternatives. But, Mike, I mean, you really underscore the point. Holy crap. Private security kicks ass. Like, yeah, it, like it really does. Like, it does. You, could, you can actually get them to be proactive, not just show up and write reports after crimes happen. Like, you can, <laughs> like, you can actually incentivize people to protect you, not to pretend like they're protecting you, not to protect politicians not to enforce bullshit laws that, that were passed by corporations. Like, yeah. And, and people, like, it's, it's funny that people have been so conditioned, I mean, you know, myself included in my own process of understanding all of this, to be afraid of that. Like, oh, my God, rich people will control uh, private security. And it's like, yeah, but you're going to be rich enough to, if you have anything worth protecting, that you'll be able to have real protection for it. Whereas with government, if you're not a giant corporation, you, you basically don't matter. They don't care. You're just a pawn. If they protect you, it's, it's for show. Well, that's the other thing, is, is that if, if a town security force were, were hired privately and run efficiently, it wouldn't be that expensive for all the citizens to pitch in and have some good security. I think what makes police work so incredibly expensive is all this waste that you have you know, in the city police force. Look at New York you know, NYPD, for example. Look at the incredible waste and the corruption that crops up from time to time. And that's what makes police work expensive. And instead of going out and actually stopping crimes, they're writing parking tickets and doing revenue mm -hmm. generation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I mean, think about if society really broke down and we had a Mad Max scenario, um, people, certain people in the community would bond together to create a volunteer posse, a volunteer security force. Because security is in everyone's interest, shared interest. And that security force would cost nothing. And they might ask, yeah, donate some ammo, you know, give us some food maybe. Everybody pitch in a little bit and it could be effective. So you're, I'm, I'm agreeing with your point that security can be affordable if it's done privately and directly without all this corruption. Well, Mike, I, I, we only have a, a few minutes left here. And there are a couple other topics I really want to hit, although this, is, this has been a blast. Um, First of all, health freedom, as you noticed, was a, a very important subchapter in the book. Did it? Did it? And it, it's relatively towards the end. Having read the rest of the book, did it? Uh, did it live up to your expectations? Well, you, to me, your book was really a collection, of, of, a very compact collection. Obviously, it 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 had to. It was kind of a Cliff Notes version of all these really in-depth uh, concepts. But much of it was a, was a collection of cause-effect statements. And this was true in the health freedom section, too, but where you, where you would say, for example, when, when uh, this law goes into effect, he, here's, here's what happens. Or when police do this, here's the consequence. And so I almost feel like I could map out your book. And I'm sorry if I'm not answering your question directly, mm -hmm. but sorry. I almost feel like I, could, I need to grammatically <laughs> map out your book as a series of cause-effect statements, because that's where the real meat is, to say this causes this. This causes that. And it got me thinking about if you look at most of the political debate that happens today, Republicans versus Democrats versus everybody else, it's, it's often a series of cause-effect statements where Obama says, if we do more quantitative easing, then the economy will be boosted. That's a cause-effect statement. Mm -hmm. It's wrong, of course, but it, that's the structure. So uh, almost every chapter in your book had a really nice collection of these cause-effect statements that um, some of them were a little bit simplified, obviously, just because of the, the, the short format, mm -hmm. but they were fundamentally true. And uh, that I, I know that you would want to expand some sections even more, maybe in version two. Well, I'm thinking, I'm thinking health freedom could be the sequel, one of the sequels. That, the health freedom section was a little... Um, uh, a little compact, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> you I, wanted I, you to know, see an encyclopedia. That's my favorite area, so maybe I'm biased, but I would have <laughs> loved to see that uh, explored more. All right. Well, I hope I at least did uh, the influence that you've had on me justice. 
in representing and including this because a lot of libertarian philosophical treatises or you know attempts to win people over they don't give people this and I, I think the work that you do is so integrally connected to the core of this message and you know health freedom the subchapter on that talks about what people traditionally think of as healthy in terms of their body and their chemistry and things like that but emotional slavery you know the psychological health issues that, that I bring into here really are, are just as big for me but uh, Mike I wanted to sort of ask on, you know, uh, you know in, in a bigger sense, that uh, what your understanding of th the significance of this message, and now that it is codified in this uh, singular work here, this book, Freedom, how this has, um, you know, uh, affected your worldview coming to this. And, and, and I, I, I don't want to say, oh, well, so you read my book and now you get it. Because I understand that the book was really one step in, in your overall journey, in your process to you know, developing your own uh, philosophical understanding of the world or wh whatever, however you would describe that. Sure. Um, but uh, don't you want to get everybody on Earth to read this book now? Well, well sure I do. And, and to answer that question, let, let me throw in here, you know, I've read a lot of libertarian books, you know, Henry Hazlitt and, and mm -hmm. Austrian economics, mm -hmm. and, you know, I've been a fan of Lou Rockwell's website for a long time, and, and, you know, a lot of this material, but what was really powerful about your book was that it forced me to catch myself thinking in the paradigm of the current system, mm. where I would be reading a section of your book, and you would, you would, you would present an idea, a cause-effect proposition, and at first I would say, no way, that's crazy. And then I would catch myself, wait a minute, that <laughs> shit could work. <laughs> uh -huh. you, know what, you know what I'm saying? It was like, what you really need to do to read this book is set aside every preconceived notion you have about how society is supposed to be structured. Come at it with a blank slate and an open mind and then evaluate it based on that, not based on the way things have been. And, and like I said, I caught myself many, many times uh, thinking in old patterns and then catching myself doing that. So that, to me, that was one of the most powerful things about the whole book, not just the message, but the fact that it makes you have, take a fresh perspective to, in order to grasp what it's saying. Cool. Well, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm really just, I'm honored that the book has had uh, as much significance as it has in your own philosophical journey, really, to influence uh, a great mind such as yours. Uh, you know, it's just an incredible honor, and, and I hope that we can keep doing business together as well in, in other ways, Mike, and I'm really excited to support what you have going on with naturalnews.com and, uh, you know, all the ways that you're expanding your business now in ways that are made possible with the, the technology challenging central control, corporatism. I'm really excited about what's going to be coming out of your laboratory and, uh, you know, the various tests and, and information that you're going to bring to the public. But I hope in the same sense, uh, you know, what, we, what we're doing here is complementary. And Absolutely. that uh, while, while you're waking people up to some practical information, you know, what we're doing with this book is, is waking people up to uh, a, a comprehensive picture. And, uh, you know, like I said, I hope we can be, the, the, our, our work can continue to be as synergistic as it has been, but holy crap, man, I, after seeing the response to this book, I really don't care about anything else right now. I don't care about myself. I don't care about Adam versus the man. Um, you know, all, all I really want is to get people to, to read this book. It, you know, it's, it's more useful than anything I've ever done in my life. And I think uh, just the conversation that we've had around this right here has been proof of that. And it's been, uh, it's been a great honor to speak to you about it. Well, Look, I, I'm, I'm a fan of your work and what you do, Adam, and this book is an incredible achievement, obviously uh, incredible insights in it. You put a lot of clarity of thought into it. There's sometimes there are just certain sentences that just blow my mind, like <laughs> when you said, um, happiness causes freedom. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> I, I had to stop the audio book and listen to that and think about what does he say and, and you know, let it sink in. So just an incredible amount of insight. Uh, I, I honor your work. I, I thank you for being willing to have this discussion. And I, I know that, I, that at, at sort of, if you don't mind me saying, as a kindred spirit of yours and the spirit of liberty and the spirit of, of protecting life, that we can always sit down and have these brainstorms and have these talks, even if we don't reach the same conclusions right away at the same time. 
I always feel like I can brainstorm with you and talk with you and even challenge you and you can challenge me. And that is what makes great society is when people can sit down and, 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 and explore ideas with a sense of honesty and integrity. And that's what we did tonight, man. Absolutely. Mike, thanks so much. Look forward to having you on again soon. Fine, under, under a voluntary society, you can have that, you know, but we can't have our system. It's two years away from 50% plus of Americans supporting legalizing marijuana. I told him, this is the message that people live and die for.